Yo everyone, it's Caius, and welcome back to my devlog series for Circle of Orion, a turn-based RPG I am making in Unreal Engine. And we'll start with congratulations to me for managing to say devlog correctly this time. Unfortunately, this will probably be a bit of a shorter devlog than before, because uh, I had less time to work on Circle of Orion and more time I had to spend working on other stuff. But that other stuff was important for long term. So let's go ahead and get into it. I want to start off by talking a bit about my design philosophy when it comes to making games. I am a massive proponent of modularity and trying to keep your games as modular as possible. The way I organize pretty much all my projects is I break everything down into one of two categories, either framework or content. The framework of my project is essentially all the core systems and mechanics, everything like the game mode and the game instance and all the different game systems and stuff like that. While the content is all the game specific data and iterations of those mechanics and features I create. So content would be all the maps and all the items and skills and quests and all that sort of stuff. The general idea is everything in the game's content should reference the framework, but nothing in the framework should ever reference the content. Inside the framework folder, or usually I create a specific plugin for it, I typically have a folder called systems, and this breaks things down even more modularly where it puts every single mechanic into its own folder. So there's a folder for combat, a folder for dialogue, a folder for the player, controller, and character, a folder for each minigame or each subsystem, like cooking. This keeps things a lot cleaner and a lot easier to find when I'm trying to find something to modify. It's with this idea of keeping things very clean and modular in mind that I ended up spending a lot of time working on the next update for Omega Game Framework, Update 1.1, which at the time of this recording I don't think will be out yet, but hopefully should be within like a week's time or so, depending on how the marketplace goes. Since in pretty much all my projects I rely heavily on the use of data assets, one of the big new features I'm adding in this version of Omega is a special type of data asset I'm calling a data item. A data item is essentially a data asset that can have almost like its own components called data traits. Data traits are sort of like a halfway between actor components and structs, and they allow you to reuse different chunks of code or different classes but from data asset to data asset irrespective of what their parent class is supposed to be, because data items technically don't have a parent class. What's Nice about this is it makes things in one hand safer because I don't have to worry about parent classes getting corrupted and breaking since everything just uses the data item parent class, but also it allows me to get a bit more creative with the assets I create. So explaining a little bit more how data items and data traits work, um, I might have three kinds of data items, say I have party members, I have skills, and actual inventory items. And then each of these will contain different traits, like, say, a party member will have a skeletal mesh and animation for their default appearance. They'll also have combatant stats that'll change, you know, how their combatant component uh, is set up. Then a skill might have a battle action, which is sort of the logic of how that skill will be used in combat. An item, however, could be something like either a potion or a piece of armor. Each of those would share the same basic traits that any item would, like price and whatnot, but they would also have unique functionality, like a potion might share the battle action trait like a skill does, because you'd use a potion in combat and it would have an effect on a combatant, while a piece of equipment like armor wouldn't have a battle action, but equipping it might want to change the skeletal mesh of the party member, in which case we would reuse the skeletal mesh trait that we created for the party member. What's extra neat about data items and data traits is they allow you to think a little bit outside the box as far as what you can do with data assets. For an example, let's say you're making Persona 5, and we'll take two characters in there just to showcase kind of how this would work. Say you take a character like Makoto and a character like Kawakami. Now, in a lot of ways, these two characters will function the same way. Primarily, they both are social links or confidants in that game. So we might create one data item called Makoto and one called Kawakami and give each of them a trait called Confidant or something that would determine things like what dialogue they had or what their description based on their Confidant rank was, stuff like that. 
But Makoto is also a party member. So instead of creating a separate data asset for her as a party member specifically, we'll just create a new trait for party members and add that to her and leave it off Kawakami. Or additionally, since Persona 5 is a game with a romance system in it, say you had one character who was romanceable and one who wasn't, like, for example, we have Makoto and Ryuji. Well, for the most part, they would all share the same traits because they're both party members, they're both confidants, but Makoto is romanceable and Ryuji is not, so we could create a new trait for that. This way we can focus more on composition over inheritance, and rather than depending on a parent class to hold all the information we might need, we just decide what information to add to what asset or entity in the game on a asset by asset basis. Continuing on from the theme of modularity, Circle of Orion will contain a chapter system for how it handles the story, where each chapter is sort of self-contained with its own quest, its own main storyline and whatnot. And as a result, I decided to utilize Unreal Engine 5's new Game Features plugin. Game features are a special type of plugin that essentially is meant to contain content for your game that can be loaded and unloaded and activated and deactivated at runtime. So essentially, if there's specific chunks of your game that you want only active at certain times, this is an easy way to do that. It's also an easy way to add things like DLC or limited time events or stuff like that. The way it works is that essentially, when a new chapter starts, it shuts off any existing chapter game features and turns that one on. And when that chapter is turned on, it'll add a component to the story game system, which essentially just handles everything regarding the logic of how that chapter works. Like what level we start at, what the name of the chapter is, what state machine we're running to handle the sort of flow of events. All that sort of stuff. And one other thing that's cool about this is it's made me start thinking about the possibility of releasing the alpha or beta of Circle of Orion in chunks, like one chapter at a time, since they can easily be added onto with these game features. I'm not sure yet about if and when I will do any sort of alpha or beta or test, but I would very much like to because I would love to get people's feedback. So we'll see how it goes, but yeah, keep that in mind for the future. Around the middle of the month, I got together with my writing group and we basically just had a big old writing meeting trying to hammer out the plot for the game. Uh, the initial plan I wanted was try to get the whole plot mapped out, but we ended up spending so much time talking about world and characters and, and really core cool stuff that we only ended up getting uh, mapped out to chapter one. And I say mapped out as in we know what happens, but there's no script or anything for it specifically. So yeah, not remotely as much as I would have liked, but it was quite productive and I've got a lot of the, the groundwork uh, for it done. But there's still a ton of more work to be done on the story front, but there's still plenty that I can be working on the game and creating scenes and stuff for. Unfortunately, this is real life and uh, I do need money to you know continue existing. So I have had to take a little more time off of Circle of Orion and started working on more stuff for the Unreal Engine Marketplace. This will be in the vein of the stuff I've been releasing, where it'll essentially be more modular game systems that you can add to your project. Different battle systems, different uh, overworld styles, and stuff like that. My philosophy when making stuff like this is to essentially make stuff that I would use, because I very well might use all of this stuff in the future. What I would love to be able to do is make systems that are so well designed and so modular that whenever I create a new project, I can just go into my Unreal Engine Vault, add whichever systems I want to it, and they work almost immediately. I just need to plug a few things up. So yeah, make stuff that I would use is kind of my philosophy when it comes to stuff for the marketplace. Kind of on that note, uh, moving on to dialogue. Remember last devlog when I said I tested out Flowgraph plugin and I decided not to use it and stick with Logic Driver for dialogue? Uh, well, I changed my mind and now I'm using Flowgraph plugin. Um, and honestly, uh, for dialogue, I like it a lot better. It's a lot faster on editor performance, but it's also a lot cleaner and a lot simpler. So there's less margin of error and it's... I just think it feels nicer to work with as far as creating, creating dialogue. See, Logic Driver Pro is a state machine system, so it's fully blueprintable, fully codable, it has all the bell bells and whistles of just creating a, a blueprint system, which is great for a lot of things. I still use it for AI, currently I'm using it for 
questing and just sort of game general game flow but it does mean it's it's a little more actually it's a lot more complicated to get your head around and with all the things you can do with it and flow graph each asset is is essentially like a data asset with a flow graph on it so it's a lot simpler and a lot cheaper and with that i've started um making remaking the dialogue system essentially and it just feels a lot nicer to work with this way so yeah i'm, I'm happy about that and i do think that the flow graph plugin might end up on the unreal marketplace i'm not a hundred percent sure some stuff on the github for it seems to indicate that it may be will and if it does i would love to release my dialogue system that i'm using on the unreal marketplace as well for you all now there was a really annoying moment this month about midway through where i had a pretty severe project breaking bug see i use code in omega uh, that is from an open source plugin called Actions Extension, which I renamed to Gameplay Actions, just so it fits more with the naming conventions of Omega. Um, for some reason, Gameplay Actions just broke. Uh, and by broke, I mean they disappeared. Whenever I loaded up the Unreal project, all Gameplay Actions were just gone, and I could re-add them, but they would disappear when I reloaded them. And this essentially broke most of the systems in the project. So I essentially spent about two, three days trying to figure out what the frick happened and fixing it. And I think the problem had to do with bad references or, or references that the project just didn't like. But more specifically, it seemed that the module for actions extension or for the, the just the actions module of, of uh, Omega Game Framework, it had either the loading phase or the module type was causing it to either be loaded too soon or too early. I can't entirely remember which one, but essentially I just changed the module type and the module loading phase, and that seemed to fix it. Now that said, I would recommend, you know, backing up your project, especially using GitHub, especially when you're using uh, Omega, back up your stuff to GitHub just in case you want to uh, cross a bug like this, and be sure to let me know if it's a recurring problem, because that would not be good. But yeah. Got that fix, everything works now, narrowly avoided a heart attack. <laughs> As that's most of the big stuff for the month, I think it's time for a bit of a lightning round. So, uh, cooking system. I did a cooking system. I'm thinking of this being the main way you'll get consumables in the game. You might still get potions and ethers and stuff like that, but I like the idea of kind of forcing and requiring the player to actually utilize the cooking system to make consumables, and also making it very convenient and easy to use. Uh, battle scripts. This is something I'm planning on adding properly into the turn-based game system for the marketplace as well, but essentially allows me to program each encounter in a specific way with specific uh, events. So for example, I can say after a certain number of turns or when the boss is at a certain number of health, when his turn comes up, he will use a specific action or he will run a bit of dialogue or something like that. Uh, I added a cheat and debug menu so I could quickly test out new features and stuff. And lastly, I've been focusing a lot more on uh, using components for breaking up different uh, elements of the game. So I have components for elementals, like magic elementals, like the different uh, fire, wind, water, that sort of stuff. I have a component for status ailments, uh, you know, for poisoning, for exhaustion, for things like that. And because I'm designing these essentially with components and each in their own system folder, I can just add the component on and everything will work and if later i decide to remove it i just take the component off the combatant and everything is taken off and you know there's no no breaking of of the game or of the features and finally i have been working on the scripts for chapter one so i can actually get dialogue into the game and that's been coming along slowly but nicely so while this was a slower month overall, I still made a decent amount of progress and all the stuff with Omega should make both this project and my future projects and all of yours that use Omega Game Framework a lot better, a lot easier in the long term. To wrap up the month, I would like to give a shout out to another devlog and this month I'm going with Project Sky Farm by Skyrealm Interactive. This is a farming simulator with roguelike elements that's made in Unreal Engine. A very anime-like, it feels a bit like Rune Factory, not exactly though, but uh, it, looked, it looked pretty interesting to me, it looked like a fascinating sort of game they were trying to do, especially since I'm not a fan of the look of the most recent Rune Factory. But yes, uh, Project Skyfall, 
I would recommend giving it a look out if it's your sort of thing. Uh, go over to their channel, give them a subscribe, maybe give them some feedback, tell them what you think. And that is about everything for this month. Uh, thank you everyone for watching, for sticking around with this. I'm really enjoying working on this game, really do believe I have the best job in the world. Uh, obviously it's a bit subjective, but whatever. Uh, and I'm looking forward to bringing you more content in the future.